class of 87, and I've had the pleasure of serving as chair of the HCLA for the past two years. For those that are not aware, the HCLA is an association of legal professionals who strive to live according to the highest intellectual and ethical standards and to apply this commitment in excellence, in service to others, and in service of justice. There is no better way for the HCLA to demonstrate its commitment to that mission than by honoring and recognizing those who have fulfilled it. Last year at this time, we were pleased to bestow the Edward Bennett Williams 41 Lifetime Achievement Award on Edward F. Harrington, class of 55. That was a tremendous event. Much has changed in the past year, but one thing that did not change was our award committee's work ethic in digging right in and beginning the selection work for this year's honorees. Chaired by Chris Sullivan, I want to thank him, all the members of the awards committee, our executive committee and our entire board for their work this past year in all areas, but particularly their work in making this award ceremony possible. And of course, we all thank Mara and her team at the college for supporting the HCLA so well. They make it easy to live our mission. Selecting honorees is no easy task. There are so many Holy Cross lawyers who reflect well the mission of HCLA. In honoring today's recipients, I would like to extend the board's appreciation for all members of the Holy Cross Lawyers Association for their commitment to justice and for being men and women for and with others. To kick, to kick off the events, I'd like to turn the program over to Chris Sullivan to describe each of our two awards today and introduce our honorees. Up on the screen, you'll see our event schedule. Chris will talk to us about the history of the, of the awards and then I'll introduce the Lifetime Achievement Award. We'll have some remarks by uh, the honoree, Ken Kunzman, class of 58. And then Chris will introduce the Distinguished Service Award and some remarks by Claude. We'll have some time near the end to break into some breakout rooms. You'll have the option of which breakout room to go into. And then we'll come back together for some very brief closing remarks. Thank you very much and enjoy. So I think at this point uh, we'll have we'll have Chris uh, introduce the the two awards. Thank you, John. <clears throat> the Holy Cross Lawyers Association created the Edward Bennett Williams Forty One Lifetime Achievement Award to recognize a Holy Cross alumnus or alumna or a faculty member whose contributions to the legal profession for an extended period of time have been truly exemplary as recognized by their peace, by, by their peers uh, and or the general public. The awardee is recognized for having made a positive impact on the administration of justice and has demonstrated his or her loyalty to Holy Cross. This year, <clears throat> the Holy Cross Lawyers Association is very proud to award the Edward Bennett Williams 41 Lifetime Achievement Award to Kenneth F.X. Kuzman, uh, class of 1958. Ken has had a complete Jesuit education. He attended St. Peter's Prep in New Jersey before he went to Holy Cross. And immediately after college, Ken, Ken entered Fordham Law School, graduating with his JD in 1961. He chose Fordham Law because Ken believed a Jesuit university law school would have the highest ethical standards. That was Ken's paramount concern in choosing a law school. Ken likes to tell a story about his close friend, John Furick, the uh, former Dean of Fordham Law School. They were classmates back in the day. And during his second year uh, at Fordham, a week before the final exam in evidence, while on his way to court on the subway, Ken's briefcase was stolen. The, in that briefcase was a whole year's worth of all of Ken's 
evidence notes. When his friend John Ferrick heard what had happened, John, who was the number one student in the class, gave Ken all of his notes. Ken used the notes and studied hard for the exam, and he received an A in evidence. Ken calls his good friend John, John the Good. John said it was no big deal, but to Ken, it was. I understand that Dean Ferrick uh, has been invited to join us today and to participate in honor, support, and congratulate his lifelong friend, Ken. Ken's first job out of law school was as a law clerk for the Honorable Gerald Foley, a judge of the New Jersey Superior Court Appellate Court. After the clerkship, Ken joined the United States Air Force as a, in the Judge Advocate Corps for three years, defending and prosecuting all sorts of criminal offenses under the Uniform Code of Military Justice. He tried cases on a weekly basis, if not on a daily basis. Upon his discharge in 1965, he joined as an associate attorney the law firm of Pinder, McElroy, Connell, and Foley, which is the precursor to today's Connell Foley. At that time, there were only nine lawyers uh, in the firm. Within three years, Ken was promoted to partner. And as Ken's legal career advanced, so did the fortunes of the firm under the guidance of the name partners and Ken. By the time Ken was named managing partner in 1990, the firm numbered a 100 lawyers. Today, it has 140 lawyers with offices in five major cities. Although Ken earned a stellar reputation in estates and trusts, his legal career as a civil litigator has been extremely diverse. He has always practiced at the highest level in many different fields of the law. And on a personal note, Ken knew Edward Bennett Williams very well. In 1968, Ken and Ed Williams, along with 10 other lawyers, had a four month jury trial <clears throat> in the federal district court for the District of New Jersey. The connection with Ed Williams and his family continues even today just yesterday, Ken received a note from Tony Williams, Ed's son, congratulating Ken on winning this prestigious award named after Tony's father. Ken is an award-winning attorney. He's been regularly selected as a best lawyer and as a super lawyer. Martindale and Hubble has awarded Ken an AV rating for holding the highest level of legal skill. More importantly, the AV designation recognizes Ken as a lawyer who practices with the highest ethical standards. Throughout his career as a civil litigator and trial lawyer, many important clients have trusted Ken for his wise counsel and strong advocacy. He has represented Seton Hall University for more than 23 years. Ken now serves as personal counsel to Archbishop Cardinal Joseph Tobin, the Archbishop of the Archdiocese of Newark, the largest Catholic Archdiocese in the state of New Jersey. But Ken's achievements don't stop there. Ken has served as the chairman of the Corel and Bertram F. Bonner Foundation, which through its sustained partnerships with colleges and congregations, the foundation seeks to improve the lives of individuals and communities by helping meet basic needs of nutrition and educational opportunity. Ken has been a trustee of the foundation ever since its inception in 1983. Since his graduation in 1958, Ken has remained focused on living a life 
of service and commitment to Holy Cross. He's been a member of the President's Council since 1963. He's been a class agent and a member of the Varsity Club since his graduation. He has also served as the president of the Holy Cross Club of New Jersey for 22 years. And two of his daughters are graduates of the College of the Holy Cross in the class of 1983, 1985. In describing Ken, a close friend and colleague wrote, over the years, I've been amazed at how Ken found time to get it to dedicate himself to all of the pro bono work that he does while still juggling the demands of his very demanding practice, being a devoted father, a husband, and a family man, period, close quote. Family is Ken's highest priority. He and his wife, Anne, have been married for 60 years. Their beautiful family includes six children, five girls, and one boy, his son, Ken Jr. Anne and Ken are blessed to have 17 grandchildren and four great-grandchildren. Wow. On behalf of the Holy Cross Lawyers Association, we are proud to award the Edward Bennett Williams 41 Lifetime Achievement Award to Kenneth Kuzman, class of 1958. Thank you, Ken. Congratulations. Thank you, Chris, for that wonderful introduction. I could have written it myself better. <laughs> but in any event, you, you acknowledged a few people and I will comment further on that. For example, I need to give a shout out to my good friend, Frank Grather, who submitted the proposal for me to be nominated. After I read his eloquent uh, dissertation, I said to him, you know, some people will say, Frank, you piled on, you're gonna get a 15 yard penalty. And he said, no, no, Ken, I would have thrown the flag and argued that I was only stating facts and of course, the uh, committee and the uh, Board of Trustees unanimously approved it. So I guess they agreed with Frank. So I had to give Frank a thank you for his eloquent delivery on my behalf. But most importantly, um, I have to recognize Holy Cross has been always very, very important in my life. It was a place where, yes, as Chris indicated, I have a Jesuit background. So my partner, Adrian Foley, once said to me, you don't have a Catholic education, you have a Jesuit education. And I said, that's true, but it's also strongly Catholic. What I learned at Holy Cross has definitely helped me. My theme today, you will hear, is integrity. That's what I was taught by the Jesuits. And they always said, be a man for others. Bear in mind my schools, we're all male at that time. So today is certainly all men and women to be a person for others. And I have tried through my life to follow that great Jesuit standard and hope I have tried to do it and accomplish part of it. Initially though, you know, whenever you're examining a person's lifetime of accomplishments, you have to know that he didn't do it alone he or she didn't do it alone. And in my case, that's absolutely true. My incredible wife, Anne, married 60 years, as Chris indicated, has been a stalwart for me through my entire 59 years as a lawyer. And she was there early on. Bear in mind that we had our six children by the time we were in our early 30s. So there was six children with the oldest eight and as an ambitious young lawyer, I certainly spent many times at night and also weekends. So the burden was on Anne through the stress that I was taking, you know, passed along to her. And without her support, I would not be receiving this award today. And I thank her so much. 
She has been there with me and continues with me today. We hope for many more years to come. So thank you, Ann, and my family for putting up with me. But to receive an award from Holy Cross is one extremely high accomplishment for me because of my love for Holy Cross. But to be tied in with the name Edward Bennett Williams is indeed a distinction that I value very, very much. Ed Williams is uh, known throughout the world as the greatest trial lawyer that I've ever stepped in a courtroom. But to me, Ed was more than that. He was again, a man of integrity. He practiced law the right way. He did it according to morals. He, no matter if he represented people charged with crimes, as in the book for the defense written by Robert Pack, who never met Ed, and, but detailed all his uh, case, many of his cases. He said, one case he pulled out and he was recommended to a client. He said, wait a minute, he's a criminal lawyer. Why do I want a criminal lawyer? So Ed in the chapter is called guilt by attorney, but Ed would, would represent Richard Nixon, represented Bill Clinton, represented Al Capone. He was just an outstanding, outstanding lawyer, but always with great, always with great uh, skills, but integrity at all times. I am so appreciative of the note from his son, Tony, handwritten to me, in which he not only congratulates me but said he's speaking on behalf of his dire family for my love for Holy Cross and the law, two things which were so important to his father, but I had the characteristic integrity to, to Ed. In 1965, I joined the firm then known as Pindar, McElroy, Connell and Foley. Again, men, of tremendous integrity. Jack Pindar, who is noted as one of the greatest trial lawyers in New Jersey. Bill McElroy was an extremely skilled trial lawyer and appellate lawyer and became an appellate division judge. Walt Connell became an expert in insurance law and deferred to handling matters from within the firm to the deference of his other partners who got all the attention. Adrian Foley, of course, one of the greatest lawyers in the history of New Jersey, and I were extremely close. I began to work with Adrian in 1965 and worked directly with him for 55 years in the most complex of cases, but always a man of great integrity. He was a surrogate judge. He was chairman of the litigation section of the American Bar Association, which is the highest esteem in the uh, association. He could have been president, but did not wish to move to Chicago for two years. When I, so that was my second family as the firm. And to this day, even with 140 lawyers, we still practice with the same integrity and the lawyers who I have surrounded with me today, and yes, I am still practicing. Um, they are absolutely sensational lawyers, but most importantly, men and women of great integrity. When I speak of women, I have to note that when I became a partner in 1968 with the firm, I came at the same time with Sonia Napolitano, who later became Sonia Napolitano Morgan, and was the first female appellate judge in New Jersey. It is that type of character that I have been surrounded with and value for my lifetime. But I have a third family, and that is my clients, people who I value and who have the same, I am so fortunate they are of the same integrity. I represented David A. Sonny Werblin. Sonny started out in Hollywood. 
became the chairman of the board of the most prestigious agency. He represented Ronald Reagan, Bob Pope, Albert Hitchcock, his wife, Leah Ray, incredibly wonderful woman, was the first leading lady for Bob Hope. In any event, Sonny and I did an awful lot together. He always considered me not only his lawyer, but his fourth son, which I value, and his son, Tom Werbin, would confirm that. But we were involved in many different deals. And I would tell you one in particular, we were negotiating a transaction. The other side said, we'll give you more money, but it'll have to be in cash. <laughs> of course, trying to avoid taxes. So he said, no way, no way. Everything is above board. Tell him no. And the guy said, can we negotiate? And I said, no. The answer is no. And we walked away from the deal. That's the type of man Sonny was. I also was privileged to represent on the player's side, Julius Irving. Once again, Julius is, is a fantastic ball player, one of the greatest ever, if not in my opinion, the greatest. And again, through the 20 years that I represented him, he was always a man of great integrity. So, I now, but in addition to my legal work, I did get involved and still am involved with trying to help others. I was introduced to the scholarship fund for inner city children by Joe Oaks, a great uh, businessman and son of St. Joseph's University who uh, invited me to join the board where he had been on the board for 30 years. What we do is we supply monies and scholarships for students who are needy to go to Catholic schools, many of whom are not only not Catholic, they're not Christian, but we feel an obligation to be able to help others. And then the schools are very, very successful and it's great tribute. We've been supported in the, in the past by Archbishop Garrity, uh, in the beginning, and now we have Cardinal Tobin, who is a magnificent prelate and who has been so supportive of what has been done at SFIC. And he continues to be and will continue to be an outstanding leader of the Archdiocese uh, in New Jersey. And we thank Cardinal Tobin, and I thank him for his friendship with me. In some, in some, I just want to say that I continue to use the word integrity because that is what I hope people who are listening, especially young lawyers, will know that there is a path to success and it always can be done with ethical standards. Many times lawyers are presented with the opportunity to uh, cut corners and the answer should be no. And I know that the young lawyers that are practicing in our firm and hopefully lawyers elsewhere will follow that. Unfortunately, in this day and age, there are lawyers out there who will remain nameless, but who you know, who are presently adopting unethical standards and uh, try to convince people of the wrongness of their position. So uh, I hope that integrity along the way will survive and I'm sure it will. In sum, I thank you ever so much for this most prestigious award from Holy Cross and uh, in the name of the great Edward Bennett Williams, class of 1941, and I thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Ken. <clears throat> uh, now it is time for us to discuss the Distinguished Service Award. Last year, the Holy Cross Lawyers Association decided to create a brand new award, the Distinguished Service Award. This award recognizes 
an individual or group of Holy Cross graduates or faculty members for their outstanding service and contribution to the legal profession by making a positive difference in the lives of others through the provisions of legal services. This award acknowledges Holy Cross graduates who through the practice of law embody the Jesuit creed and value of living as people for others by sharing their gifts generously, pursuing justice and showing concern for the poor, the marginalized and the least of us. The award recipient must have made significant impact for others and must have demonstrated a loyalty to Holy Cross. Today, <clears throat> the HCLA is very proud to recognize Claude J. Kelly III, class of 1983, as the inaugural recipient of the Distinguished Service Award. Claude is being recognized for his extensive work serving in his home state of Louisiana, where he is the chief federal public defender for the United States District Court for the Eastern District of Louisiana. Before coming to Holy Cross, Claude attended Jesuit High School in New Orleans. While at Holy Cross, Claude, who was taking an advanced Spanish course, decided to go on a mission to Guatemala. It was a life-changing event. Claude got to see the Jesuit creed of being a person for others, being lived out in real life. He decided then and there that he wanted to work for social justice. After graduating from Holy Cross, Claude returned to his native New Orleans where he attended law school at Tulane University. While in law school, he clerked for the office of Harry Connick Sr., whose son would become an international singing star, Harry Connick Jr. Even to this day, Claude remains a great friend to the Connick family. Upon his graduation in 1987 from law school, Claude served as a assistant district attorney in the Orleans Parish of the district attorney's office. That's where his career took off. He was rapidly promoted to senior assistant district attorney and quickly became an esteemed member of the legal community in New Orleans. When Claude left the DA's office, he started a solo practice as a criminal defense attorney. Later, he would become an assistant federal defender for the Eastern District of Louisiana. In the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina striking New Orleans, the Fraternal Order of Police asked Claude to defend police officers in state and federal court, including the defense of a white police officer who had shot an unarmed black teenager. Claude was also appointed to the panel of the Capital Defense Fund of Louisiana and served as lead counsel in many death penalty cases. In 2014, Claude returned to public service and was named Chief Federal Public Defender for the Eastern District of Louisiana. During, his, during this same time, Claude also managed to serve as the acting Chief Federal public defender for the state of Mississippi. In 2016, Claude was nominated by President Barack Obama to be a United States District Court judge for the Eastern District of Louisiana. This was not a job that Claude had sought. In fact, he said, it seemed like it came out of the blue. His judicial nomination was supported by both Republican senators from Louisiana. And he was unanimously approved by the United States Senate Judiciary Committee to be appointed 
as a United States District Court judge. Unfortunately, to a moratorium that was placed on all judicial vacancies, his nomination for District Court judge expired at the end of the 114th Congress. Throughout his career, Claude has maintained close relationships and excellent working relationships with prosecutors, defense attorneys, and politicians in both parties. He has often served as an unofficial mediator when divisive issues arise in legal and political circles in New Orleans. Today, Claude teaches continuing legal education classes and representing the federal bar in many professional and civic meetings and seminars, all while continuing to manage his busy office. But Claude's pride and joy are his two daughters, Kate and Rita, who are young women just starting their professional lives with all of their dad's love and support as they make their way in the world. It is my pleasure to introduce the inaugural recipient of the Holy Cross Lawyers Association's Distinguished Service Award, Claude J. Kelly III of the class of 1983. Congratulations, Claude. Thank you very much, Chris, and thank you very much to the whole Holy Cross community. I, um, this is quite an honor. It's amazing to me. When I first learned of it, I was stunned um, and I am truly honored. When I was notified, I, I thought it gave me the opportunity to think a lot about Holy Cross and that has felt so good. After graduating from Holy Cross, I moved back to New Orleans and at times Holy Cross seems a bit remote. It's distant memories, great memories, but um, distant. And this has really given me the joy of reliving and thinking about the school and how wonderful it's been to me. Whenever I do hear the mention of Holy Cross, and sometimes it's on just ESPN scores, or when I hear Clarence Thomas mentioned, or perhaps our most current famous alum, Dr. Anthony Fauci, I always take note of that and I'm always proud because Holy Cross is a very special place and it's had a lifetime impact on me. But as Ken mentioned too, and has been the theme, that effect actually began on me before Holy Cross. It began with the Jesuits. Like many Holy Cross students, I went to Jesuit High School, Jesuit High School here in New Orleans, which is really an institution here. It's almost a cult. Um, Jesuits propelled me to Holy Cross, to a school in a city, Worcester, which I honestly knew absolutely nothing about. The, um, the two biggest factors in my life have been my mother and the Jesuits, AMDG. Jesuits' motto, as stated, was men for others. It was a constant theme, a constant refrain at Jesuit High School. And as Chris mentioned, to graduate at Jesuit, we had to do a senior service project. I was, as a junior, it was in high school, I was in an advanced Spanish class, and one day a Jesuit missionary, Father Donald Ballinger, came and spoke to our class, and he asked if any of us would like to spend the summer with him in Guatemala. I went, it did change my life. At Holy Cross, I was a political science major with a minor in religious studies, and I remember taking an interdisciplinary class, which something that only a unique school like Holy Cross could offer where it was 10 students and four professors from different um, departments. It was an economics professor, a literature professor, and the focus was all taught um, was Latin America. It was led by Father Manning at Holy Cross, who was probably my favorite and most influential teacher there. After I graduated from Holy Cross, I took a year off before going to law school, and I went to Nicaragua and taught. And this was the time of the Sandinistas, and at the time, I really wanted to be a Latin American revolutionary. Um, that career path didn't work out too well. So um, I ended up being a public defender, the next best thing. And don't get me wrong, I'm no missionary. I, I do love the game of criminal law and trials. There is no higher high than when you're cross-examining a government witness and you have them on the ropes. It doesn't get any better than that. Or even just the minutes 
from when they announce the jury has a verdict and you're standing there with your client waiting for it to be read. Time just stands still. It's a great feeling personally when I'm standing alone with my client um, who usually has nothing um, against the power of the federal government and all of its resources. And when you occasionally, emphasizing occasionally, beat them, it is incredible. I had my last jury trial a few months before COVID came on, and um, I had forgotten how thoroughly exhausting they are. When you're in trial, the world, the outside world just stops. And I'm beginning to realize that trials are kind of a young person's game. But fortunately, I'm in a state where I actually get as much satisfaction um, at the end of a case. In federal court, it's usually after a plea deal. Um, and my client on some level, and sometimes they even say it, not often, but on some level, they realize that they know they could not have had anyone fight as hard for them, even if they had paid them a ton of money. If I had a dollar for every time a client has said to me, if I had money, I'd get a real lawyer. Um, it, it, I actually smile to myself. I actually like that. It kind of challenges me. As um, Chris said, I've, I've been fortunate to represent a variety of clients. The, the four police officers after Hurricane Katrina, um, when the DOJ Civil Rights Division came to New Orleans um, and pro um, prosecuted some hurricane events, um, it was very interesting because I usually go against police officers and it really made me realize how tough their job is. For years, I worked with the Capital Defense Project of Southeast Louisiana doing death penalty work, and there is no good death penalty case. The game there is to save your client's life. Uh, and something I really learned from that work, and I try to use in all of my work, is the concept of mitigation. And it's often at sentencing to show the judge that my client is more than just the actions that landed him in court. If there's good in him, there's some good in him. And Sadly, often there is terrific trauma in his past that led to these events. I've been asked a million times by people, how can you represent these horrible people? Um, people love to think the prosecutor wears the white hat and we definitely wear the black hat. That is until their son's in trouble and then they want a tiger on their side. Um, and for me, it's not the constitution, it's not the sixth amendment. I generally like most of my clients, not all of them, but uh, I, I it's funny, I always find something to like about them. And it is the challenge, the, the, devising the strategy, the best plan, whether it's to fight it, whether it's to work for the best deal. And it, it can be fun. You know, I had a lot of wild times at Holy Cross and I met so many great people who, when I think about them, I only smile. It was a totally different world for me. It was so cold um, for so long and I'd never seen snow of any extent, much less like that in the mountains. And I remember those cold days having to work, walk down from my lady to class and, but it was a great experience. And one feeling I, I often reflect on, I can remember going to mass on Sunday nights at nine o'clock. It was usually after a crazy weekend. And just the feeling it gave me, it was kind of a feeling of resetting. Um, Resetting yourself physically, mentally, emotionally, it was so good, it just made you ready for the next week. And I find my office, the group that I work with, is it helps me reset. It's hard, it's hard work that we do, and it's hard to do this work alone because you are constantly beat on. You're beat on by the prosecutors, you're beat on by the judges, and most of all, you're beat on by your clients. That's the truth. But the sense of community, it's almost like a Jesuit community um, in our office is so vital that I have 15 people who work here, eight lawyers, including me, and we help each other. I'm always inspired by them. I'm supported by them. I'm challenged by them. But our community in our office is our salvation. And like anything, you know, this work can be tiring, exhausting, but I'm really fortunate to work with a fun group of smart people we all get satisfaction out of helping our clients. And so I thank you again. And this award really is for all of our public defenders. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. It's really phenomenal to get to hear from both of you, Ken and Claude. Thank you for joining us today, for sharing your stories and for all of the work you do for others. I think we've all seen just how that Jesuit mission, we always say it, it gets into, it gets into your body, into your blood and like it or not, you can't shake it. So thank you for being two models of that for all of us.